Well, we've been in this series of uh, messages looking at the Psalms, each week a different one. And you, if you've been doing your homework, you've been writing your own Psalms from your heart and getting them to me, right? In person or an email. And, uh, and then uh, each one, if you notice that each one's been different as it comes in and it has a different flavor and a different feeling. This one uh, very, touched me very uh, deeply because it was so vulnerable and so real. So this one of yours. As a child, I learned obedience through fear of retribution by my earthly father. You know my every sin, past, present, and future, and yet you still love me. Why? My earthly body and mind are constantly at war with you, but it's my spirit that's reminding me of your love and forgiveness. The promise in your word of becoming a new creature in Christ is the most confusing promise. Although I praise you with my words, my mind is near the gutter most of the time. How can an animal change what it is? I'm that animal. When will I change? With my eyes, I see others changing for the good, it seems. What's wrong with me? With your love, you drew me. You alone know who is saved and who's not, and I want to see others through your eyes of love and forgiveness and not my condemning eyes. You reached out to me when I was drowning in my sins and you put me on a sturdy, safe rock. Why then do I always insist on getting as close as possible to the slippery edge? I'm the habitual child, unwilling to let go of childish actions and grow up to truly be a mature spiritual man. Will you grant me the time here on earth to become that mature spirit? You allow me to sleep at night, and I know you wake me in the morning. Thank you for that simple act of love towards me, and please allow me my maximum life here on earth. Maybe I'm destined to fulfill a work that you planned for me. Trying to understand you and your love for me is above my knowledge. I'll never attain it. All I can do is praise you. That's real. Um, when I when I read that song, I thought, why did that ring so true? And I think it's because everybody needs renewal. Everybody needs uh, redemption. Everybody needs forgiveness. And um, and I don't know if you noticed this, but I've read a lot of books that deal with forgiveness over the years. And uh, they're good and everything, I really appreciate them. I've stolen stories from them, you know, for sermons. But the, the thing about them is they really focus a lot on how we can learn to forgive others. How we can learn to forgive the people who have hurt us or wounded us. And then in passing, maybe there's a little few pages about how we need to be forgiven. Um, and that's a really neglected thing. And I, and I think about that, I go, well, maybe it's because it's so much easier for us to see the faults of other people, right? I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I look out at you all, I look at you people in the video and I can see your faults. Oh my gosh, it's just right there for all of us to see, right? It's very apparent. Me on the other hand, not so much. <laughs> okay, maybe a little. But um, it's hard for us to look at ourselves in the same way that we analyze the people around us, um, that we see their sins. Now, I don't think that renewal comes out of um, our forgiving others alone, you know. I think that it flows primarily um, from our seeking and experiencing forgiveness in our own lives. It seems like that's when God can do the renewing work in us. Not when we're calling out the sins of others or practicing forgiveness for them, to them. But when we actually um, allow God to do his forgiveness in us, in our hearts, and it's a very uh, difficult thing. Maybe that's why renewal is such a rare thing in our day. Um, 
Let me read Psalm 51. It's our psalm today from Scripture, and it says that it was written when the prophet Nathan came to David uh, after he committed adultery. And David writes this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me, and against you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight. So that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with this sop, and I'll be clean. Wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. And then he says this, which is, we've all heard before. Create in me a pure heart of God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I'll teach transgressors your way and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You don't delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, you don't despise that. And your good pleasure make Zion prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem, and there'll be righteous sacrifices to delight you. The Lord teaches from this. Teach us how we might experience the freedom that comes from forgiveness and for coming out of hiding. And, uh, and do your incredible healing work in each one of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. I kind of was nervous about doing uh, preaching from this psalm because it's so uh, <clears throat> strong and it's so personal. And... Um, And it's kind of uh, shining a light in, into each one of our hearts and our lives. And, and so we see each other a different way. The other thing is that forgiveness can be pretty tricky. Because um, the, we have these, like, you know, you know, like in Star Wars, we have deflective shields, you know, that protect you, you know, Star Wars. They, they would uh, fire stuff at you, but you'd put your shield up, and it would just bounce off and not get you. I think we have that about our own sins about our own faults and, and struggles. Uh, we, we like to deflect onto other people, and, uh, and it's easy for us to get defensive and to shift the focus to others. I mean, that's just that's part of who we are. And yesterday, I think I was watching Dr. Phil, you know, which, who doesn't like that? And, uh, and he had a real interesting couple on there. The, the husband had been having a sexual affair with someone, not his wife, and he says, and Dr. Phillips, the reason is that after several years of marriage, she's kind of let herself go a little bit, his wife. So he had no choice. He had to go out and get involved with this other woman. But this is what he says. Dr. Phil, I want you to know, I'd be willing to forgive my wife. <laughs> I would. Isn't that, isn't that big of him? He would, he, he would forgive his wife for letting herself go and forcing him to have this sexual affair with this other woman. Dr. Phil looked at him with that Dr. Phil look like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and, uh, and his response was, wow, I didn't realize your wife forced you in the bed with this woman and tore your clothes off you. <laughs> that your wife had done that to you. I'm thinking, what's wrong with people? <laughs> and then I thought, well, isn't that what, what we all do? I do that, you know, you put, if, you can, if you can get it off on somebody else, you know, put the blame there. But we don't have to deal with our stuff, right? 
And, and we'd be willing to forgive others their stuff, you know, as long as the focus isn't on us. But um, this psalm doesn't let us get away with that because it's a response to very specific, real situation. David's sin. And this isn't, you know, people in the church, got, the elders got together and wrote this psalm about David. This is from his heart. And, and he shows us in this how we can experience renewal with, with his honesty and his ownership and all of those things. Now, the, the context, that most of you probably know the story, it's in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. And what happens is, um, David's out, it's, it says it's springtime, and all the, all the kings are out with their armies, you know, doing springtime battles. And except David decided to send out his armies to do all their ravaging, whatever they do, and he stayed back because, you know, he's taking care of Goliath. He's, Saul's gone now. He's the king. The people love him. He's been prosperous. He's been victorious. He's got everything going for him. And in a, a few chapters before that, he, he had brought the Ark of the Covenant back and, and set it up, and there was a huge celebration. And he got all excited about it. He was praising God, and he started dancing, and he tore all his clothes off and danced naked in front of everybody. And they had a big celebration. He was the king. I guess he could do whatever he wanted. And when he got home, his wife was not pleased. In fact, she said, it said that she ran out to meet him and said, what are you doing? You know, and then you're thrilling the slaves of the servants. The slave girls of the of your servants are getting thrilled. What kind of classy guy are you, you know? And he said, well, at least they'll remember me. <laughs> and, and it said from then on, they never had sex with his wife. The Bible shouldn't be read by children, by the way. <laughs> adults only. So you think, well, okay, so here he is. It's springtime. He does, he's been victorious. He's honored. I mean, he doesn't have to go out in the battles anymore. He has other people do that for him. And he's walking around on the roof uh, the, because his wife won't sleep with him anymore. And uh, he's walking around, you know, peeping Tom and around. The, and, and he sees Bathsheba they've taken, taken a bath. And uh, said, and then it says very quickly in the Bible, she was very beautiful. And so he gets this idea and um, sends for her. And she comes to the palace, he has, he has sex with her, and then he sends her back home. Get rid of her, that was, it's done. And it said that in time, uh, she found out she was pregnant, and so she sent word to him and said, hey, I'm pregnant. Uh, my husband's off fighting your war. And so uh, David's got a problem. now. Have you ever noticed that when we make a choice, it leads to another choice and then another choice, and it usually doesn't get better, right? We, we've talked about this before. In business, they call it a death spiral. You make a bad choice, and things get really bad, so then you make another bad choice, and it gets worse, and then you make another. This is what David started doing. So he made this bad choice. Uh, his wife thought the bad choice was dancing naked in front of the servant girls, but uh, he... Uh, Maybe made another bad choice, beat the dominant in the middle of the night. I don't know. But then he made another bad choice, and he sent for her to come and, and sleep with him. And then he made another bad choice. He sent her away. She, okay, I'm done. And, uh, and then uh, now she's pregnant. So he has an opportunity to confess his sin and get right with God and make this thing right and take care of everything, right, as you would do. And he thinks, I got an idea. Let's send and have the captain send her husband back home, give him a month's leave so he'll sleep with her, and then they'll think it's his kid. Problem solved. So he does that. The guy comes back, sleeps on the steps of the palace because he said, How can I, with my friends and everybody out fighting, how can I go in and sleep with my wife? I'm going to stay here and be, be celibate on your porch. And David tries to get him drunk and still sleeps on the porch. And well, David goes, that's not working. So he sent him back to the battle. Another choice, you know. And you think, well, it's okay, so it's okay. You tried something that didn't work. Now is a good time to confess, right? Now is a good time to see what God can do. Make a different choice. So he sends word to the captain. Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to storm, storm the uh, opponent's uh, gates, and I want you to put... 
the husband on the front line. And then when he's there fighting, I want you to pull all the soldiers back away from him so he's all alone. See what happens. And so he does, and of course the guy's killed him. So David basically plans his murder and kills him through someone else. And then he goes and uh, calls Bathsheba back and said, hey, why don't you come be my wife? The other one is not happy with me. Why don't you come? And so, uh, everything's fine now. The husband's dead. Nobody knows. He's married Bathsheba. She has a kid. No one will question it. Everything is perfect. And then this pastor shows up. Don't you hate it when the pastor shows up? I tell you, Nathan, his pastor, comes in and tells this really stupid sermon illustration, as we're prone to do, you know. And uh, I said, the rich man had all these flocks of land and uh, sheep and he had everything. And then there's this poor guy who has nothing but this one little, little baby lamb. And he played with his children. And then they ate at the table with him. And he loved his little lamb. And so the rich guy had to put on a party for someone, so instead of using any of his lambs, he went and stole the other guy's one little lamb and butchered it and served it. And David was furious. This is a horrible thing. And uh, we're going to have him pay. He's going to, we'll put him to death for this. And then Nathan says that famous line, thou art the man. That's the first time, you know how in the golf tournament they always say, you the man. This was the first time it was used. It was here in the Bible. <laughs> you the man. You are the man. And David now is stuck. Someone's found out. This whole plan has gone awry, and he's now fine. Now, you know, you think about things, but that's a story, right? That's a one thing after another after another, and you go, aren't I glad my life's not like that? Aren't I glad that I have not been, you know, walking on the roof, checking out the neighbor's yards. I, I'm not doing any of that stuff. I'm not dancing naked in front of the neighbor's servant girls, you know, and getting my wife mad at me. Uh, there's other things that get the wife mad at you, you know. But, um, and then, uh, aren't you glad you didn't, you know, have that affair and then murder the husband and then kill, kill her? But, you know, we're so much better. We are so much better. I think we can take pride in that, and we should just come to worship and say, praise you, Lord, that we're not as bad as David. Right? Because at least we're not that scoundrelly. But I'll tell you what. The more I've... I've been a pastor, the more I realize that all of us have stuff under the surface and we hope that Nathan doesn't come to us and say you're the one. You know, we hope that the phone doesn't ring and we find ourselves exposed. We hope that we don't have to be vulnerable. We hope that we don't get found. We hope that we don't do the stupid things one after another, one more stupid thing after another, all the way down in the death spiral. We hope that doesn't happen. And some of us, instead of uh, being guilty, we just feel a little bit afraid that our life that we've built so perfectly is going to unravel. And we don't want that. So we try and hold it all together as best we can. Well, there's no freedom in that. There's no freedom in carrying the guilt, and there's no freedom in holding it together and trying to look like everything's okay. Neither one. Neither one has. Where's the freedom? Well, it comes right here in this song. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast, a right spirit within me. Don't cast me from your presence and take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. That's where the renewal comes. It's not what we do. It's not, uh, can we keep our life perfect all the time and hold everything together? Then we'll feel renewed? No. We'll just feel afraid all the time. Is it that we, we hold the, like in that, what's that statue in New York City of uh, Atlas holding the world on his back, you know? Are we like that where we just have all of our stuff up there and we're just 
okay, Lord, I'm trusting you today. Lord, help me to trust you today. And no, there's no freedom in that. The freedom is in what God does in us. The freedom is all about what God does because it's not about us and it's not about our sin and it's not about uh, what we can do about it. It's about what God wants to do in us, which is create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. I know what the right is. I've just gone away from it. So renew that in me. And don't withhold your Holy Spirit from me. Now, I don't think that God withholds his Holy Spirit. I, what I think is that when we find ourselves either trying to hold it all together and, and experiencing fear or uh, trying to hold our guilt up as best we can and take care of it, either way, we, we build little barriers between us and God, protecting us. And pretty soon the barriers are so high, we, we don't... We don't experience the Holy Spirit anymore. We don't experience God's presence anymore because we've walled ourselves off. There's no freedom in that. Now, if we were to experience this renewal, without blaming and just saying, Lord, you know me, I need your forgiveness, I need your cleansing, I need your presence, I need your right spirit in me. When that happens, it's an interesting thing because as soon as that is, is uh, stated here, first thing he says, is it, it's like he's been in AA, and all, all of you who are in AA or NA or different groups, you know this, one of the things that you do as you go through your steps, one of the steps is that then you become the mentor, the teacher, sponsor for somebody else to start to. And so he says, I'll, then I'll, I'll teach transgressors your ways. Sinners will turn back to you. Save me from my blood guilt and my tongue will sing your righteousness. Open my lips, my mouth to declare your praise. It's a, it's a turning to people around us. And, and this is a, one of the first examples in the Bible of being a wounded healer. That the one who is the greatest sinner, the one who is in need of the forgiveness, the one who finally acknowledges honestly the problem me is them turned out at the very point of their failure, at the very point of their uh, pain, struggle. That's where they're teaching. Right. I love that, you know, because you know, here in this congregation, I don't. I hope this isn't shocking to you. You know, there's people who struggle with stuff here, and usually we think what we'll do is we'll teach on the areas that we're confident in. We'll teach on the areas that we have figured out. We are the areas that we are objective and we have knowledge about, and we'll do our, our coming alongside people in those areas where we're really strong, which is stupid and unbiblical. The only place we have to share as wounded healers is the point of our struggle. And that's where we have credibility. And that's where it rings true when we come alongside and teach. And they go, oh, I guess they know what I'm talking about. The sacrifice that God wants is not a bunch of religious stuff, the psalm says. But what is it? What is it that God wants us to bring to Him? Remember? Right? A broken and contrite heart, a broken spirit. That's what God wants us to bring. When our heart's broken, when we realize that we've been on our own death spiral, and we've deflected away at everybody else and ignored our stuff, when, when God shines his light in that, and we realize it, and we go, oh, my heart is broken over the crap I've done. It's not about anybody else. And I need forgiveness. And we experience that. That's what God wants us to bring. Because then he can deal with us. 
As long as we bring our successes to God, He can't deal with us. Because we're not open to Him. It's only when we have a broken heart that He said, okay, let me show you what I can do. Um, I, I've, I've shared from this book, Ruthless Trust. Uh, Brennan Manning is a fabulous uh, writer with his own issues, <laughs> a lot of issues. He has great insight about this. He, he says, often trust brings on the far side of despair. When all human resources are exhausted, when the craving for reassurance is stifled, when we forego control, when we cease trying to manipulate God, trust happens within us. And the untainted cry, Abba, into your hands I commend my spirit, surges from our own hearts. See, that's the offering that we bring. Where, here I am, you know me. You know me. And you love me anyway. Then here's what he says. Sometimes we're dishonest with, with Jesus. Sometimes we harbor an unexpressed suspicion that he cannot handle all that goes on in our minds and in our hearts. We doubt that he can accept our hateful thoughts, our cruel fantasies, and our bizarre dreams. We wonder how he would deal with our primitive urges, our inflated illusions, and our exotic mental castles. The deep resistance to making ourselves so vulnerable, so naked, so totally unprotected, is our implicit way of saying, Jesus, I trust you, but there's limits. There's limits. I can't trust you with all that's going on inside me. But we can. See, that's the thing, and that's the freedom when we, when we realize God can create a right spirit, a clean heart. He can, he can bring his healing to us only when we admit who we are, what we've done. Verse 1, which I kind of skipped, says, Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions and wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. God can do what we can never do by holding together or by carrying the load or by pretending it's not us or by blaming someone else who made us do this. You don't need to go with Dr. Phil. I mean, you can if you want. You don't have to. You actually can go to Jesus who you can trust and who can handle you and say, Lord, I bring it all to you. Have your way in me. Create me a clean heart, O Lord. That's the word of the Lord today. So, Lord, bless us with your peace. Bring your cleansing and your healing and your forgiveness and help us to not miss any of it.